think I have a sound check going here, right? Yep. And I'm going to have to grab the clicker too, right? Yep. So we know that Teresa is on uh, the live stream with us today. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody who's watching on the live stream, including Teresa. And then Shabbat Shalom to everybody here in the house today. Hey, we have Mr. Wayne that's shown up today. Shabbat Shalom, Mr. Wayne. All right, so I know that, let me see, was everybody here at our house for Shavuot? I think so, every single one of you. And it was, that was such a great day. I mean, we did the count. There were 31 adults and 13 children at our house. We were like, wow, we didn't know we could have that many people at our house at the same time. That was pretty amazing. It looked like we could maybe fit a few more in. Maybe we could have 50 next year. But anyhow, so we just want to thank everybody for making the Shavuot celebration the wonderful ceremony that it was. Because I really think that God was so pleased to see us out there. All of his kids were out in the, in the yard at the same time. And... We sounded shofars, and we were waving, and we waved the loaves, and we waved at him, and we're like, that was just so cool to have all that food and fellowship and the fire. And even Graciela, Graciela and Ismael, I don't know if you're online, but thank you so much for leading dance because that was just fun. And we're going to have to have to be more diligent to do more of that in the future. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody um, got their proper thanks for making Shavuot the great success that it was. And then the next thing, okay, now that we've passed Shavuot, we're going to have this long, dry, hot summer, except for there's another Campos that's coming to town. There he is, Massey Campos, y'all, Fabian's brother. Um, what state does he live in? Florida. He lives in Florida. So he's going to be coming and joining us on July 15th. So please, everybody, mark your calendars for July 15th. 2.30 p.m., not in this room. Everybody say, not in this room. Not in this room. It's a Shabbat service, but it's going to be downstairs in the Great Hall. Remember where we did Passover? So Massey's going to be there. So guess what? We have to promote this thing, y'all. I'm going to be putting it on the Way of Messiah Facebook page. I know not all of you are on Facebook, but whoever is on Facebook, please take that and share it to your personal pages. Share away. And then we're also going to have it on, I guess we're going to have it in email. So if you're on the email list, guess what? You can forward that email to friends and family. So that would be really, really good for you all to do because we need to pack that house. Um, they are an amazing, amazing couple. Actually, I think it's he and his wife will be, um, will be both sharing with us. And I do want to read just a little bit about why is he coming and what is he doing. I zip this up. Because, you know, here in Texas, it's pretty windy. If you don't have things secure, that wind just catches it and takes it far away. You're chasing stuff down the parking lot. It's no fun. All right, so what is Massey going to come talk about? You see what it says in the flyer there, the biblical founding of America. But I want to read to you what he has on, on his website. They are dedicated to seeing all Americans understand the foundation of our nation and understand those rights. Those rights come from who? God. Amen. His ministry is called Self-Evident self -evident Ministries. Why does he call it that? He says, the name Self-Evident was chosen because it states in the Declaration of Independence that freedom for all and freedoms coming from our Creator, they are truths that do not need to be proven or reasoned, meaning they are truly self-evident. So that's his ministry. What he says about us, he says their vision is, the vision of self-evident is to see all citizens become a productive member of the United States of America. Why? Because we need to understand the founding documents and to realize that God is the one that gave us rights along with morality to keep those rights. And their mission is to bring the truth of the Constitution to Americans by way of workshops, speaking events, and unique curriculum to educate all Americans on what their constitutional rights and freedoms are and what is connected to those rights, the freedom that can only be found in a relationship with God, our Creator. So in America, it seems that we are continually growing further and further away from the understanding of true liberty. Do you see that happening? 
A lot of people just want to give that away because, because why? Because they're going to get stuff. People think that getting stuff for free is the way to go, and that is not the way to go. So thank God Massey and his ministry is spreading the word, taking us back to our biblical foundation to know that freedom is not free and there's a cost to it, and we have to stand for the truth because that is slowly being taken away from us. The enemy is being so slick right now. But on his website, it also says that they continually, uh, America is growing further and further away from the understanding of true liberty and where it comes from. In doing so, we constantly grow further and further away from the foundation that our founders established. He says, the Bible says in Psalms 33:12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. It is clear to see that the blessings of God have been on America since the beginning. And it is the desire of self-evident ministry to keep it that way. So everybody mark your calendars. We're going to be promoting this on Facebook, July 15th, 2.30 p.m., downstairs in the Great Hall. So we want to make sure that we have a really good turnout for that. It's not just a Way of Messiah event, even though we are hosting it, and this church is helping us to host it as well. And it's going to be free, but he is going to be taking up a love offering. So make sure you let people know that we need to be bringing donations and a love offering because they're traveling all the way from Florida. They have another engagement here in Texas, but this is what they do full time as a ministry. So that's how they actually um, keep, them, keep themselves sustained. And one more thing. And they'll be, they'll be selling um, homeschool curriculum and T-shirts. Oh, and I think they usually have hats and uh, merchandise. Um, after, like after sunset. <laughs> okay. It's so like in the evening, and that also helps to support their ministry. That's really, really good to know. So y'all, there, there's going to be merchandise, but that homeschool curriculum sounds really, really special. All right. So now that we've talked about Massey coming, there's another, uh, there's another opportunity for us to embrace also, and that is if y'all haven't heard about this movie, The Sound of Freedom. Angel Studios is the same studio that has brought us The Chosen. Have you all heard about The Chosen? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and man, um, Angel Studios is really producing a lot of really very impactful uh, media right now. And another thing is called Homestead. But you can see all that stuff when you go to the Angel Studios website. But what we want to talk about upcoming is in July, is in theaters starting July 4th, is The Sound of Freedom. And what that's about, it's about an agent who goes undercover to um, rescue children who are caught up in, in sexual human trafficking. And that's something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, if I could quit my job and do full time to rescue children, that's exactly where I would be because I just feel so grieved about that. And I know God is too. This movie will not be easy to watch. It's not entertainment. But it's, it's well done. We've already seen the trailer. But if you go to that website, soundoffreedommovie.com, you can see the trailer for yourselves. But we really want to pack the theaters. There's also a way to do a group, like a watch party. If you want to do it online with, with other people and friends, you can do it that way. Um, tickets are on sale at angel.com backslash freedom. They literally are wanting to pack the theaters with 2 million people. Why? Because that is the same number of children who are trafficked not just since it started, since that evil started, but yearly, annually. There are two million children who are kidnapped and sold into human trafficking. It's like heinous. It's just the worst evil we can imagine. So we want to support the movie, and we want to donate to that. Um, if you can't go to the movie, perhaps you could at least buy tickets for someone else to go to it. And the big reason that they want to pack the movie houses out is because... There are a lot of people that don't even realize that this is a thing, mm -hmm, right. that this is a reality. Mm -hmm. that a lot of people just like bury their heads in the sand and pretend, well, it doesn't impact me, mm -hmm. but it can impact you in a heartbeat. Yeah. So that's it, the other reason they're trying to put two million people in the theaters. Right. And America is not exempt from that. There's a lot of um, offenders here in America. Um, just, just quickly, just to let you know, the Super Bowl. Is, is a really big offender of human trafficking. That's where a lot of people, a lot of children are kidnapped. Sadly, is at the Super Bowl. Can you, can you even believe that? So it's just happening in, in small neighborhoods, small towns, big towns. Um, the enemy knows no boundaries. 
Um, no one's exempt from it. So we all have to be, and when you're out, if you're ever out and about and you see a child by themselves, don't leave them by themselves. Make sure you stand by them and wait for their parent or find out if they have a parent because it's just happening everywhere. So anyhow, so um, let's just make sure that we support Massey Campos uh, coming June 15th and then also this movie that's opening July 4th. And with that, did I say July 4th? July 4th for that, July 15th for Massey. Oh, that's right. He's not coming in June. He's coming in July. So we have plenty of time to promote uh, Massey. Let's go back for some people that might not have seen that. This is Massey Campos coming to promote or, or to remind us the founding of this country, and it's founded on biblical principles that are God-given rights that we have. He's coming Saturday, July 15th, downstairs, 2.30, in the Great Hall. So we're going to promote that. We'll be sending that out in email. So when you get the email, please send it out to your family and friends. So we want to pack the house. Okay. You want me to keep it right there? There we go. That's right. But let me just briefly say here that uh, we, we had this graphic out um, probably about five weeks ago. But we're not going to be able to do some live worship for a while, and we haven't done live worship for the last, what, four weeks now? We apologize for that. Uh, just pray. Keep us in prayer that God will send us musicians. I would love to have a piano player, someone who can, you know, sing. They don't have, we just need singers, we need pianists, and maybe like someone who plays the violin. So just pray for that, that we would have that keyboard. Um, so we, we, we know how important worship is. And so we've kind of had to put that on hold for a while, but we still have our video worship, and we're thankful that God allows us to do that. So you want me to keep it on this screen? I know I'm just like click happy right now. She has, she's got the, she has the power. Yeah, there you go. Are you? And now we're going to do this. So we need to. Yeah, the Torah readings. Um. But you know what, we can. Um, yeah, tell them about that. Yeah. We can actually. Um, if y'all just want to write down some scripture, I had on my heart, I'm not going to read them, but I'd really like for you to write these down to read later. I'd like for you to read Ephesians 1 20 through 23, and then Ephesians 2 1 through 10. And then also Colossians 3, 1 through 4. I know a lot of people are just going through some really heavy situations, and I think sometimes we can just so focus on those heavy situations that we don't realize the power that we have. You know, We have power in Messiah because he has purchased us. His death on the cross was very costly. His blood sacrifice. When we have faith, when we say, I do, yes, Messiah Yeshua, I believe you died for me. We have that power. He gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can actually rise above anything that we're going through. And I know it's easy to say. We can say it to ourselves all day long, but when we're in a hard situation, that's when we really have to apply it, right? So I just encourage you all to read that. And that, t that talks to us about how we are seated with Messiah in the heavenlies. We, have, we can share. In, uh, from, are you talking about Colossians? All of them. Oh, any of them? Oh, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. And Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And then Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Should I just read the Colossians? Was that the one that was the most impactful? Or was it Ephesians 2? Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Let me just go ahead and, ahead and read that one. I think it was Ephesians 2, and I was going to emphasize on verses 5 through 8. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah. And here's the key part. Even though we were dead in trespasses. Don't ever let the enemy condemn you or make you feel... Unless, of course, you know, he's, he's uh, giving you that, that um, conviction. If you feel condemnation, that's never from the Lord. But when you feel convicted, if you're in a situation where something didn't go right and you feel convicted, that's the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. But th that doesn't mean that he's done with you. That means he loves you. If you never get disciplined by the Lord, that's when you have to be a little worried, right? And conviction and condemnation yeah. are different. Right. If you feel really super bad about something and you confess it and you repent, the Lord cleanses you. 
you are good to go. Move on. But if you really obsess over that and you're feeling just like guilty and condemned and you just like think, you know what, I can't even go out outside of my house anymore. I can't be around people. Or you start putting restrictions on yourself. That's condemnation. And don't allow the enemy to do that to you. But do allow the discipline of the Lord because that means he loves you. So when we, we were still not doing the right thing, he saved us. I mean, he saved you before you were even born. He knew that you would choose him. He knew you would choose him and have that faith. So be encouraged by that. So where did I leave off here? So um, where did I leave off? And you were dead in your trespasses. I'm just going to start in, in, in Ephesians 2 because maybe I'm supposed to read the whole thing. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens. Now, who is that? He's just a big, fat loser. He's not going to be around much longer, y'all. And it's the spirit now working. And so he's the one that is exercising authority in the lower heavens and the spirit now working in the disobedient. But we are not disobedient, are we? That is never... We don't wake up and say, oh, I'm going to be disobedient today and test the Lord. We don't do that. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, thank you, Lord, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. Do you get that? We were dead, but he made us alive even when we were already, when we were dead, he still made us alive, and we continue to be alive today. You are saved by grace. So together with Messiah Yeshua, he also raised us up and seated us with him in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us. And he is so kind. So I just want to encourage you all to just read uh, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, and then also Colossians 3, 1 through 4. During our time of video worship, I just want to encourage you all to really focus on the Lord during video worship and to intercede for others. If you know others that are going through something, don't let it be about yourself today. Let it be about those others. Let it be about the children that are caught up in human trafficking, that, uh, that movie, the, the Sound of Freedom, right? Let your intercession today be for those children who are caught up in human trafficking. Let your intercession be for a family in North Korea who have been put in prison with their two-year-old. For life. For life. Because they had a Bible. I found that out this week, too, and that just grieved me to my core. And I think a lot of things that we're going through kind of pale in comparison. Not to put what we're going through like it doesn't matter like on a lower scale, but we live in great freedoms in this country. So things that we go through here, we know it's temporary. For that family, it's not. So intercede for those who are going through some really, really super hard times during this time of worship that we have today. Sorry, you got me stirred up now. Okay. The next time you're going through something difficult, think of that family. Yeah. I want you to because... In the long run, whatever you're going through is not that big a deal. It just isn't. I don't care what you're going because through. Because it's temporary. We have, we temporary. have some very dear friends that are going through some major issues. My sister's going through some major situations right now. But we have to remember, we've got to keep it all in perspective. Are you in prison? Are you in prison with your child for life? Yeah. So put your challenge in perspective we do live in the greatest nation in the world at the greatest time to be alive yeah. in this nation that's why Massey's coming to talk to us so we don't take this for granted right yeah but we also need to put our trials and our own tribulations in perspective nothing that we go through nothing that you will go through that you're going through now or that you have ever been through will be as great as what the Prince of Peace went through for you to be redeemed. Right, right. Nothing. Right. And as Carol said, this is all temporary. This, 
There's a song we used to do. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Yes, that's right. No truer words have ever been spoken. This is the short side of eternity, you all. This is the boot camp training. The psalm says our life is but a vapor. And God says we're going to have tribulations, so just expect it. If you're having a good day, just think, well, maybe in another week I'm going to have something I need to go through to make me stronger. But whatever we go through, it's for the, His glory and our benefit, and we get to minister to other people that way. And what you were just reading, too, that, that in Ephesians 2, we need to remember that whatever trials we're going through, whether they, whether they take us to the grave mm. or whether they're over in a time frame, they're all temporary. Yeah. Eternity is forever. Right. Yes. Okay? So as we're going through whatever trials we're going through, again, we put them in perspective. And if we need to, we set them aside because worrying about them, this is important if you don't get anything else. Worrying and fretting over whatever you're going through will not make it any better at all. It will have zero impact on what you're going through. Pray about it and also share with others. And do this. Don't stay isolated. Do this. <laughs> and laugh at the enemy. That's right. Just laugh, laugh at, at the, the devil. Enemy. We laugh. Because you take the wind out of his sail. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that whatever it is that you're going. Remember. That's right. Whatever it is that you're going through, if it falls into the category of death, theft, or destruction, mm -hmm. it is not from the King of the Universe. That's right. Because Yeshua Himself said. That the devil comes mm -hmm. but for three reasons. To kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so if whatever you're going through falls into those three categories, even sideways, then it's not of God. That's right. That's it. Sorry. Yeah. You and, just the, got me. and the enemy doesn't huh. sleep, y'all. No, he never sleeps. I, Fabian and I were talking about that. He never takes a break, ever, never, ever, ever. He never takes a break, yeah. So don't think... You know, don't when we get wrapped up in whatever we're dealing with, don't go, huh, I just need a break. No, you just need to push through. Because we can yeah, do everything. We can do up. all things through Messiah who strengthens us. All things. It's never and that our means strength. All things. Mm -hmm. We we <laughs> talked about this last Thursday when Terry was teaching us, and Terry asked the question, What does all things mean? Everything. What well, means all things? Everything. It doesn't mean anything short of that. So if we can do all things through Messiah who strengthens us, whatever we're going through, He strengthens us in that moment and mm -hmm. we can go through it. Yes. And we can go through it together. That's right. We're That's, never alone. I, again, I come back to Fabian. And me and the, the elder was speaking earlier this morning. Careful. You're about to pull it off. We need each other, whether we know it or not. we got folks that are not with us today. We need them too. This is community. This is not a religious organization. It's not, and I say this carefully, it's not a church. It's not a social club. When I stand up here and share with you from the Word after we read today and we have a midrash, those are all opportunities for us to be sharpened. Mm -hmm. I learn from Carol and Toby and Deb. And Rosa, I learn from all of you. That's my Sweet opportunity day. to be sharpened. It's yes. our opportunity to sharpen each other. It's about community. Because mm -hmm. when it all falls apart, this is what Fabian reminded me of. When it all falls apart, look around you. Mm -hmm. These are the people that you have. Forget about getting on the phone and calling Uncle Sugar. He's not going to come bail you out. Because the phones won't work at that point. Right. Forget about going to many, not all. Forget about going to many of your, quote, friends. They're going to be trying to deal with their own life. They don't have time for you. Mm -hmm. If they don't know the master, they will not have time for you. It's going to be all for me, none for you. And there's going to be some good church folk that are going to be the same way. Y'all don't think just because people go to church they're born again. They're not. There's a lot of church people that are going to bust hell wide open. Because they go to sun, they go to congregation every Sunday. There's some messianics that are doing the same thing because this is what we're supposed to do. And yet they don't have a relationship with the master. And when death comes for them, they're not. 
going where they think they're going to go. The point is, is that we need each other. We need to be more community than we are now. Shavuot gave us a chance to start up establishing oh, yes. kind of a community idea for each other. Deb is going to be making goulash for all of us when the, when the time comes. <laughs> and James, who is not here today, he may be on the road, is going to be fixing chili. So he we'll be living on goulash like and chili. Yeah. We were all eating chili for a week, weren't we? It was like enough for 50 people. All right. But we do want to just, before we go into the service, we want to say how much we love each of you. We appreciate each and every one of you and everybody online and people that couldn't come today. We love you because it's an encouragement to us. We know God's called us to Navarro County. And so if it wasn't for you all, we wouldn't be here. Right. We'd just be sitting in our house doing a podcast. <laughs> so, which we did for a while. Which, yeah, we did kind of did that for a while. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you all. I'm going to. If everything Shabbat is, Shalom. Shabbat everyone. Shalom. Did we say? We said Shabbat Shalom. I think so. Didn't we? And I know you were praying earlier, but you know, we haven't prayed. Right, for this opening. With the congregation, with those online, so let's right. do that right. Fabian, grab a microphone. Come up here and pray. He has a microphone. <laughs> for anybody online that doesn't know, this, this is our elder, Fabian Campos. Yes. pray let's pray to the father dear heavenly father we just thank you first of all for, lord for the breath that you give us to get up today yes. we don't give enough thanks father for the breath that you give us that you instilled in us father since the beginning mm -hmm. your spirit that went in through the nostrils of adam to wake him up we thank you for that lord mm -hmm. that we're here today for shabbat bless this service father bless everybody that's here Everybody that's online, Dan and Carol up here, Father, as they're going through for your ministry for you, Lord. And we stand behind them. We thank you. Now let your spirit fill this place. Yes, Father. And just let us just worship freely mm -hmm. as we want, Lord. Mm -hmm. As Carol always reminded us, which is a great thing, that you increase and we decrease. Yes, Father. And we just thank you, Lord, that we can do that, Father, in everything that you want us to do, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you for the week. We thank you, Lord, that we're here for Shabbat, Lord, yes. in your appointed time. Mm -hmm. Lord, and we just thank you for that, Lord. Now open our hearts and our minds to receive what needs to be given today. Yes, Father. And we walk out differently, Lord, mm -hmm. than when we came in. Yes. We, we just thank everything, Lord, for you, mm -hmm. Lord, and we just bless you, mm -hmm. Father. We just thank you for that. Yes. In Yeshua's name, yes. I pray all of this. Yes. Amen. 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 Thanks, Ooh, what a powerful prayer. Thank you, Lord. So, this looks different. Where's okay. my clicker guy? I mean, oh, I, mean I have to pass the power on to Stephen. That's right. He gets to drive, but just for a little bit. <laughs> I've got to get the live streamers up on this one. Hang on a second. We, have another, we still have a clicker. There we go. That should be coming up in a minute. So we, okay, we, so we went with Psalm 98 sanders. instead of Psalm 100 just to change things around. And we have Carol so far. And Tori, did you bring yours? We have Tori, and I guess that's it. So right after we do Psalm 98, we'll be sounding the shofar. So if you will stand with me while we do Psalm 98. It's a, it's a two-pager. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Be jubilant, shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and melodious song, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout triumphantly in the presence of our Lord. Amen. Yes, and we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise, for you are a king who is highly exalted. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. If you'll join me in the Our Father. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us the food we need today. Forgive us for what we have done wrong, as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. And the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Machuto Le'olam Vayed. Yeshua HaMashiach Ata Adonai Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Blessed is the name of His glorious kingdom forever and ever. Yeshua Messiah, You are Lord. Amen. Do you know why we kneel like that and bow? Because we are declaring that He is Lord. And one day, everybody will bow. It's better for us to do it now in obedience and reverence because one day, every not, knee will uh, bow. That's right. So, let me see. Stephen will go ahead and I will go ahead. Bar Kud Adonai Hamvorak. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Vayed Baruch Ata Adonai Yeloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bikar Venu Micho HaAmim Venatan Lenu Et Torah To Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Bless Adonai the Blessed One Blessed is Adonai the Blessed One for all eternity Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen. And the Vishamru. The people of Israel shall observe Shabbat to maintain it as an everlasting covenant through all generations. It is a sign between me and the people of Israel for all time. That in six days Adonai made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day ceased from work and rested. You must remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Adonai your God brought you out with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore Adonai your God commanded you to keep the Shabbat and the Via Havta. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. And so, if you'll join us up here for Kiddush. Um, let's have these folks come up first. Uh, Teresa, we want to know when you're going to fix the next 18 inch hollow. It feeds like everybody. <laughs> we would have brought you something, Wayne. We would have brought it to you. 
he's getting oh, some exercise. Exercise. I know he's he's, he's getting, getting some exercise. Steps. That's good. Oh, that's good. Take as much that's as That's right. Just pull on it, brother. <laughs> Take a torta. <laughs> torta. <laughs> that's fun. I love chocolate. And then this side. All right, now we're good. Hey, you know what? Uh, Rose the left jaw some. <laughs> See that? There you go. Totally. Where's free, Mike so. today? <laughs> we're missing the two mics. Thank you. We might oh. have to get another. Or do we leave extra batteries? Yeah, Tori, yep. leave some up here. All right. There you go. Grab some there. I'll go grab some cups. Okay, Mama will split that with you. It's good to have to fill more cups. I know. We like that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're, 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 you guys are the worthy ladies. That's right. It's okay. It's so close. This is Anna's first bed. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. Don't worry about it. No. They're not. This is ours. Thank you. Okay. And let me get. Hey, Dan. Them? Yeah. Teresa said she will do the challah bread when uh, her kitchen's cleaned up from the construction. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Excuses, excuses. I like the Hispanic man saying the challah bread. That's right. So, and I know that on the live stream, Fabian, are we. Are we it kind of framed up in there, not blocked by the? Uh, okay, good, excellent. I got you covered. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Bore Pri Hagafen Amen. Click. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the Universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua, who said, "I am the vine, and you are the branches." Lachaya. And then the bread. Ha moxi lecha min ha rets. We give thanks to God for bread. Our voices rise in song together as our joyful prayer is said. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam ha moxi lecha min ha rets. Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua, who said, I am the bread of life. Amen. So we just have, we got Brink and Carmen with a K. We have Nathan. We have Rosella. Bean and Tori. Great. And I think I have Stephen who will help out. I'm trying to find the next piece. There we go. Okay, kids. Yep, that's everybody. May you be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Ladies, including the little one with the hiccups. May you be like Rachel, Rebecca, and Leah. Whoops. Hand me that blue phone right over there. Should be up on the post. Yep. Sorry. See the sign that says live stream? Sorry. So much going on. So many pieces. So many pieces. Thanks. <laughs> Father, we bless you for these children. We thank you that this is the next generation. 
We ask you to make them bold for you. Give them an understanding of your Torah and who you are. Introduce yourself to them in a way that they're not familiar with. Make them so full of your Holy Spirit that people literally are healed by being in their shadow, just like your servant Peter. We bless you and magnify you. Ministering spirits, we charge you in the name of Yeshua to hedge about each child here to keep them protected and keep them safe and out of the reach of the evil one as they get their spiritual feet under them. We do so in the name of Yeshua. Father, we thank you for your blessings on them. Amen and amen. Thanks, Stephen. So I'll take that one back because, whoops. Yep. Too many moving parts, I'm telling you. We got parts and pieces everywhere. Yeah. Let's make sure these are on. Yep. Test one, two. Turn that one off. Last thing we need is feedback. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Once more, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Help me, Nate. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Watch me. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, my Yeshua. Nate's helping. Is he helping? Good. Yeah, yeah, he's helping. Awesome. About time. I mean, the others don't want to. He name atov umanayim shevet akim gam yachad. He name atov umanayim shevet akim gam yachad. Okay, go mingle. He name atov. He name atov. La 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 la. He name a to, he name a to. La 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 la. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for sisters to dwell together. In unity, in unity, la 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 la. In unity, in unity, la 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 la. He name a tovu manai, shevet akim gam yakan. He name. 
ma tovu ma naim Shevet akim gam yakat Hine ma tov, hine ma tov La 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 Hine ma tov, hine ma tov La 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 Behold, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for sisters to dwell together in unity, in unity. La 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 la. In unity, in unity. La 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 How good it is to be community. Now that's good. I should write that as a slogan. What a great Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, Father, for your presence being here with us today. Father, we do need you. We need that grace. Oh, my goodness. Every day, every moment of the day, every moment, every hour. And thankfully, Lord, before we were even born, you chose us because you knew that we would choose you. It's not predestination. We still have a part to play because of our faith. You surround us with your grace, and we are new creations. We are new creations in Messiah Yeshua. We are no longer that old man. We are now that new person, and it's still a, prog a process, Father. We know that we fail, but we get back up because you have grace for us. We love you, Father. We love you so much for sending Messiah to be with us. We, we thank you even more so for that Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, that empowers us to live every moment of this day, to intercede not only for our friends and family, but for our community, for those around us. Lord, you put us here for a purpose. And even though it's hard, we know in your strength, we can truly be salt and light and love and compassion to those around us who are in despair, those who have no hope, those who are lost, those who are broken. Father, we're not perfect either, but we have the power of the Ruach to bring light and love to that dying generation. So, Father, we give you this, the rest of this time that we have together, and may you go with us this week empowered and changed like Elder Fabian prayed for us at the beginning. May we leave here, Father, with hope and with light and love that only comes from Messiah Yeshua. We bless you and we thank you. Amen. So I'm going to turn this over to Carol directly. But that's okay because we're going to be reading the word. Interesting. Yep, so while you're dealing with the technology issues now, we can, hey, we're going to deal with something Faye, that doesn't involve technology. One? God's word does not involve technology. Hallelujah. Let me, I, but just before she gets started, this is going to turn into one of those preachy days before it's over with, I can tell. We've already been preaching. That's right. <laughs> Listen. Uh, Father, my wife already prayed. We thank you for your sweet spirit. Yes. yes. Realm of death, we make a declaration to you. Yep. You hear us. Mm -hmm. You listen to us. Mm -hmm. Because we are speaking to you in the authority of the Most High. Yes, we are. We will worship the King of the universe. Mm -hmm. And nothing you can do will stop that. That's right. And so we laugh at you. Ha, ha. You <laughs> failed. You ah. failed. Amen. Yes. Because Yeshua is King and you are exalted. Yes. 
And Father, as we move forward, we thank you for filling this space with your presence as we read your precious word, which is more powerful than a two-edged sword. We bless you and magnify you, for you are king. Amen. Hey, Dan, That's before... I'll say that, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Did you have something you needed to say? Elder? Just don't forget to pray over the when you do the word for everybody's blessing. That's, That's right. right. Got, that, gotcha. Thanks for that reminder. And hey, let's all say that one powerful word together. That first Hebrew word you ever learned that literally means in English, praise God. You got it? You ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> Woo! Yes, very good. And... Pastor Dan is going to pray over us. Uh, we're going to have some That's readers right. today. Again. Um, we need to switch the, and we'll go ahead and switch the um, PowerPoint we're, so we see what button. we're doing today. Yep. So we are you doing. Got the yeah. So let me go and do the blessing and I'll go back there and get out of the way. Yes, yeah, so for all the readers. Mm -hmm. We'd burn up a bunch of time. Who cares? <laughs> if you get tired, go home. If you get tired, well, on the live tired, stream, if you get tired, go get a cup of coffee and popcorn yeah. or whatever or, or come just, back. Or just lay down and keep listening. That's right. May he who blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless everyone who comes up to honor God in his Torah. May he bless you and your family and your loved ones. And may everything that you put your hands to prosper in the name of Yeshua. Amen. I think we'll have to just use some discernment here and hit That's on the, you. we're going to hit the highlights. You've got the whole dose of that. We, we're going to just hit the highlights. Um, does anybody need a Bible up here to read from? If you're called, well, actually, I'm not going to call on anybody. If you want to read, you can just let me know and I'll guide you through it. With We've got scriptures up here. It's not giant print, but it is large. So if you, if you need glasses, bring those with you. But we're all starting... As the screen tells us, Numbers in Numbers 4. I took this off earlier when I sent it to show far. Let me put it back. I'm going to um, ask maybe uh, Gretchen and Elijah to be uh, some, uh, readers, readers from this and maybe Fabian. And um, whoever is now 13 years old, if they want to read, they're welcome to do so. And I know that, hey, you know what? Let's just quickly uh, say that Caritza and Ivan are back, and they brought baby Joshua. Baby Joshua, he's been a fighter already, man. He's been, already been in a little spiritual battle, right? Yep. And uh, God, God prevailed in baby Joshua's life, and we're glad he's here today. So has everybody got, uh, has everyone turned to numbers yet? So Numbers chapter 4 is where we'll start. I need to get there. So I think we're going to skip. We're going to start uh, reading in uh, chapter 5. And I think that I would like to have uh, a man's voice set the stage. So we're going to have Elijah, Big Bean, also known as Big Bean, come up. You can, you can use this one or bring your own. Whatever makes you feel more comfortable. All right, so you're going to do chapter 5, 1 through 10. Chapter 5, 1 through 10. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And he needs a microphone. All right. The Lord instructed Moses, command the Israelites to send away anyone from the camp who is afflicted with the skin disease, anyone who has a bodily discharge or anyone who is defiled because of a corpse. You must send away both male or female, send them outside the camp so they will not defile their camps, where I dwell among them. The Israelites did this, sending them outside the camp. The Israelites did as the Lord instructed Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites, when a man or woman commits any sin against another, that person acts unfaithfully towards the Lord and is guilty. The person who is to confess the sin he has committed, he is to pay full compensation, add a fifth of his value to it, and give it in give it to the individual he has wronged. But if that individual has no relative, 
to receive compensation, the compensation goes to the Lord for the priest, along with the atonement ram by which the priest will make atonement for the guilty person. Every holy contribution the Israelites present to the priest will be his. Each one's holy contribution is to is his to give. What each one gives to the priest will be his. And Miss Gretchen, we'll have you read uh, verses 11 through 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak, speak to the Israelites and tell them, if any man's wife goes astray, is unfaithful to him, and sleeps with another, but it is concealed from her husband, and she is undetected, even though she has defiled herself, since there is no witness against her, and she wasn't caught in the act. And if a feeling of jealousy comes over the husband and he becomes jealous because of his wife who has defiled herself, or if a feeling of jealousy comes over him and he becomes jealous of her though she has not defiled herself, then the man is to bring his wife to the priest. He is to also bring an offering for her of two quarts of barley flour. He is not to pour oil over it or put frankincense on it because it is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering for remembrance that brings sin to mind. The priest is to bring her forward and have her stand before the Lord. Then the priest is to take holy water in a clay bowl and take some of the dust from the tabernacle floor and put it into the water. After the priest has the woman stand before the Lord, he is to let down her hair and place in her hands the grain offering for remembrance, which is the grain offering of jealousy. The priest is to hold the bitter water that brings a curse. The priest will require the woman to take an oath and will say to her, If no man has slept with you, if you have not gone astray and become defiled while under your husband's authority, be unaffected by this bitter water that brings a curse. But if you have gone astray while your husband's authority, while under your husband's authority, if you have defiled yourself and a man other than your husband has slept with you, at this point the priest must make the woman take the oath with the sworn curse, and he is to say to her, May the Lord make you into an object of your people's cursing and swearing when he makes your thigh shrivel and your belly swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your stomach, causing your belly to swell and your thigh to shrivel. And the women must reply, Amen, Amen. All right, so we'll have Robin read verses 23 through 29. And remember, everybody, um, write down your comments and your questions as we read through the Torah portion. And we just went through something that definitely is going to, should have some comments and observations. Definitely. Carolyn, I'll just tell you this. Carolyn and I had an interesting conversation about that this morning. Okay. Yeah, and you said it was 23 through? Uh, 23 through 29. Okay. Then the priest is to write these curses on a scroll and wash them off into the bitter water. He will require the woman to drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and it will enter her and cause bitter suffering. The priest is to take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, wave the offering before the Lord, and bring it to the altar. The priest is to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar. Then he will require the woman to drink the water. When he makes her drink the water, if she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, the water that brings a curse will enter her and cause bitter suffering. Her belly will swell and her thigh will shrivel. She will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is pure, she will be unaffected and will be able to conceive children." This is a law regarding jealousy when a wife goes astray and defiles herself while under her husband's authority. 
or when a feeling of jealousy comes over a husband and he becomes jealous of his wife. He is to have the woman stand before the Lord, and the priest will apply this entire ritual to her. The husband will be free of guilt, but that woman will bear the consequences of her guilt. So now we need to uh, turn to Numbers chapter 6. Toby's going to read 1 through 8. Chapter 6, 1 through 8. The Lord instructed Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them, when a man or woman makes a special vow, a Nazarite, a Nazarite vow, to consecrate himself to the Lord, he is to abstain from wine and beer. He must not drink vinegar made from wine or from beer. He must not drink any grape juice or eat fresh grapes or raisins. He is not to eat any pro anything produced by the grapevine, from seeds to skin during his vow. You must not cut he you must not cut his hair throughout the time of his vow of consecration. He must be holy until the time is completed during which he is con which he con concentra consecrates himself to the Lord. <laughs> He is to let the hair of his head grow long. He must not go near a dead body during the time he consecrates himself to the Lord. Ivan, do you want to read? Do you want to read? Okay. So pass that to Ivan when he comes up. So Ivan's going to read uh, 9 through 15 in that same chapter, uh, chapter 6. Chapter 6. 9 through 15, Ivan. If someone suddenly dies near him, defiling his consecrated head, head of hair, he must shave his head on the day of his purification. He is to shave it on the seventh day, and on the eighth day he is to bring two turtle doves, doves or two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest is to offer one as a sin offering, and the other as a burnt offering to make atonement on behalf of the Nazarite. Since he sinned because of the corpse, on that day he must consecrate his head again. He is to rededicate re his time of consecration to the Lord and to, bring a year and to bring a year old male lamb as a restitution offering, but do not count the previous period because he is, because his consecrated hair became defiled. This is the law of the Nazarite. On the day his, on the day his time of consecration is completed, he must be brought to the entrance to the tent of the of meeting. He is to present an offering to the Lord, one unblemished year old male lamb as a burnt offering, one unblemished year old female lamb as a sinner offering. One unblemished ram as a f fellowship, fellowship offering, mm -hmm. along with their grain offerings and drinks, and drink offerings, and a blanket of unleavened cakes made from fine flour mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers coated with oil. Thank you. Can you pass that to Fabian, please? Fabian, can you read next? Verses 16 through 20. 16 through 20? Yes, sir. Okay. The priest is to present these before the Lord and sacrifice the Nazarite sin, offering and burnt offering. He will also offer the ram as a fellowship sacrifice to the Lord. Together with the basket of unleavened bread, then the priest will offer the accompanying grain offering, and drink offering. The Nazarite is to shave his consecrated head at the entrance to the tent of meeting, take their hair from his head, and put it on the fire under the fellowship sacrifice. The priest is to take the boiled shoulder from the ram, one unleavened cake from the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and put them into the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his consecrated head. The priest is to wave them as a presentation offering before the Lord. 
It is a holy portion for the priest in addition to the breast of the presentation offering and the thigh of the contribution. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. In chapter 6, verses 21 through 27. It's basically to the end of the chapter. Sure, yeah. This is the law of the Nazarite who vows his offering to the Lord according to his separation, in addition to what else he can afford. According to his vow, which he takes so he shall do according to the law of his separation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel, you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. So, um, is my lapel mic still on? Yep. Okay. Because I wasn't here. All right. So, we have a limited amount of time now. So, we're not going to read uh, chapter 7. You can read that on your own at home. Uh, also, the Haftarah, which is Judges, you could read that home as well when it, you have free time for that. But what we want to turn to is Acts. And I wanna really want to have Gretchen read this one. So, let's turn to Acts 21. And I think you have the TLV, right? Yeah. So I've got it up here for you. If you want to just use this one, you're welcome. Acts 21, 17 through 26. <laughs> Did it flip? Oh. 21. Yeah, the, the page had flipped. There we go. 17 through 26. All right. Acts 21, 17. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed us gladly. On the next day, Paul went in with us to Jacob. All the elders were present. After greeting them, he reported to them in detail what God had done amongst the Gentiles through his service. And when they heard, they began glorifying God. They said, you see, brother, how many myriads there were, there are among the Jewish people who have believed, and they are all zealous for the Torah. They have been told about you, that you teach all the Jewish people among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. What's to be done then? No doubt they will hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who have a vow on themselves. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. That way, all will realize that there is nothing to the things that they have been told about you, but that you yourself walk in an orderly manner, keeping the Torah. As for the Gentiles who have believed, however, we have written by letter what we decided for them to abstain from what is offered to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from, and from immorality. The next day Paul took the men, purifying himself with them. He went into the temple, announcing that when the days of purification would be completed and the sacrifice would be offered for each one of them. That was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
How isn't that great when you can read an account like that in the Brit Hadashah, the apostolic writings that lines up with what was in the Torah? Because you know, when the disciples were walking the earth, even when Paul was walking the earth, they didn't have the apostolic writings. Those weren't in place yet, so they only had the Tanakh, the, the Torah, the writings, and the prophets to draw from, and that was, those were the scriptures. They were complete. They were perfect. They didn't need anything else. But not saying we don't need apostolic writings, because we do. Those are very important. Those are great commentary. So where do we want to go from here? We want to pull up your, your stool, the Rabbi Moray stool, for some discussion and midrash. Did you all write down questions and comments? I got some ideas. And I think we didn't bring up some, we didn't bring up the lights in the back of the room too well for people, did we? So well, we might want to uh, do that can so do people that. can see their notes and that's better, thank you, yes. All right, so... You got something you, do you, you don't need this. Well, I don't need this either. Oh, but we're going to need this. it out there. Yes, we're going to need it out there. Okay, so I can be a... So I'll just, I'll just put the microphone up here, so if anybody wants to say anything. Whoa. Is that too low? Yeah. Did you almost fall? A little bit. Are you okay? Shorty stool. So we'll keep the microphone up there. Okay, who you wants wanna, to start where? You pass it around, though. There's a, there's a boatload of stuff to talk about. Really. Crickets. Everybody just wants to go home early, I guess. Okay, Robin, Robin thank you. Yay. Yeah, I, I noticed that um, since that jealousy offering and stuff like that <sighs> applied to just the woman whose um, husband was jealous of her, suspected her of cheating on him. But I was kind of like, okay, if um, are, were there any consequences for, I mean, I guess if, if there was a, usually another man involved in there, was, were there consequences for him? Or um, were there consequences for a man who was cheating on his wife? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of odd that it seemed like the consequences just <laughs> were for her. <laughs> uh, we, I don't know. We <laughs> uh, kind of discussed this this morning. This, it, most of us don't think about this. I'm going to give pass that off to Gretchen. That's a great question, we're, and we're going to go there. What we have to do is we have to be careful not to paint some picture that's not true. Okay? Because the dudes then are just like dudes now. It, nothing's changed much. However... I would put this on you to think about while we go to Gretchen before I call Carol back up here to share her revelation with you. Actually, this is, this is, you're going to love this. <clears throat> they, this was a Torah community. This was not today. This was not the Canaanites. This was not the Amorites. This was Israel who was a theocracy living under the constitution of the Torah. We do not. We have never done that. Okay? We, so so our, our, uh, our perspective, our, I guess perspective, our perspective, yeah, our mindset is, is, is different from what theirs may have been. It doesn't change the realities of humanity, but there's something we're going to get into in just a second with that. But so, so hang on about the whole why we don't read anything about the man. You're going to like it. Go ahead, Gretchen. I just had two thoughts. Carol, turn me down a little bit. Um, one was that... Oh, okay. All right. I'm not sure if it's correct or not, but I believe I learned once that adultery at this point in time was technically when the woman, a married woman, cheated not the other way around. It just doesn't work that way. That's not what the, the understanding of adultery was because we do see men having plural wives and technically that would be adultery, but it's not adultery. And, and we even see those men blessed for having these very large families. I mean, Jacob. For just, example. For example. Like literally the tribes came from him and his multiple wives. So there was a different understanding of um, adultery than we have in modern day society. The other part I think is really important to pay attention to is the very last verse in that section where it says in 31, where it says the husband will be free of guilt 
but that woman will bear the guilt. It's very telling there because the husband is responsible for the guilt of his wife. And we see over and over again in the Torah where he is responsible for any oath that she makes. He is responsible for it because he is her husband. And so in this way, he would be responsible for her discretion and held responsible for said discretion because they are one. And so this whole process, which seems so unfair and kind of demeaning and humiliating in our view, I mean, they, they had covered her hair, they took her hair down, she was in front of everybody. This is very humiliating type situation for the woman. Um, uh, however, if she was indeed, indeed vindicated, it was public and he looked foolish. And if not, if she, if she was guilty, he was released from her guilt as her husband being in charge of her, being over her. You know, he, he is over her, so he's responsible for her choices. Does that mean, I don't know if I'm making mm -hmm. really good sense yeah. there, but I think that that last verse is very telling. It's very different than how we look at things in our modern day view. We're just sort of like, wow, that was awful. That was awful. This is, yeah, this, this is, you know, this one's trying to get a little, the guy on the side. Yeah, the side guy. This one's going to get a little deep before it's over with for sure. Because, quick Bible quiz, which comes first, Numbers or Leviticus? Leviticus. That's good. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, Everyone in Israel is commanded, including husbands. You shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. I would guess that a wife would be the children of your people. Wouldn't you? But you shall love your neighbors, you love yourself. I am the Lord. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not, of course, that's the whole differentiation. Don't mix things and all that sort of thing. And that goes on. It talks about whoever lies carnally with a woman, that would have to be a man, that is a bondmaid, betrothed to a husband and not at all redeemed, nor given her freedom, she shall be scourged. They shall not be put to death because she is not free. And he will bring his trespass offering unto the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle, a ram for a trespass offering. And then the priest shall make atonement for him. So even there, we see where she's basically suffering more than he is. But the point was, is that the husband was supposed to set all the example. He was supposed to be the Torah keeper in the house. He was supposed to bring his children up in the admonition of Torah. So he was supposed to be the Torah instructor in the house. There's no requirement. And this is going to be tough, but if you all came here for easy word, you wouldn't keep coming back. I'm just going to tell you the truth. There's no requirement for him to take her before the high priest. What we just read is the only reason he takes her before the high priest is why? Jealous. That's the only reason he took her to the high priest. There's nothing to say him and her couldn't sit down and have a tay to tay with, did, did something happen that we need to talk about? Now I know that that's foreign and that sounds ludicrous from our perspective, but I'm here to tell you because dirty laundry. That one has forgiven me of multiple situations that she didn't have to. But we sat down and we talked about it and she exercised grace. And grace is not a New Testament concept. Right. So there's no requirement for the husband to take the wife before the high priest. But what we noticed here too, when Carol and I were talking, unless somebody's got some else to want to throw in the middle of this before I throw the curveball out. I was going there. Boy, come on, bring that. So we don't see Hosea bringing his wife before um, the people maybe who drink the better water. And I'm going to submit that Hosea's wife probably was on faith. I'm going to say yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty there, clear that that happened. So and there we go. We can argue that that was his whole purpose. However, doesn't matter. Let's deal with reality. The reality sure. is, he had to have been any 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 human would be hurt. Yeah. Any any human would be hurt. Yes, so and, and she was unfaithful before he took her in as a wife. Already. Yeah. 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 And so here we are. Now we're dealing with Israel. 
Israel as a whole. We're dealing with the microcosm of Israel, specifically a family, a wife, a husband. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw some things out and see if I can get y'all to start clicking things in place. What's another name for a wife? Spouse. Spouse. What about when she's first married? A bride. So now we have a bride and a husband. Who are we? Of the husband. Who is the eternal husband, right? What happened with Israel as a whole once they got into the promise? <laughs> They cheated on their husbands. And we read here that what's going to happen if you cheat now, if you drink this and you have cheated, what's going to happen? Her thighs going to throw, her belly's going to swell, her thighs going to rot. When you look at what happened to Israel, it wasn't from a physical sense, but what happened to them? They were destroyed. They became nothing from something. They became literally what. We read in the Torah that the wife would become Israel. Once they were unfaithful to the covenant and to Adonai, became a watchword. They became a curse word. They became a curse in their own nation. So you have here a picture of right and you have here a picture of the bride the bridegroom and my bride so could it be robin back to your question could it be possible that we don't see anything specifically about what the husband's supposed to return or what he's supposed to happen with him because the husband is supposed to represent Adonai in this situation. Yeah. God never takes us when we fail, when we are unfaithful. Mm -hmm. He never takes us into the holy of holies to embarrass us. Ever. It demonstrates his mercy as the perfect bride, a perfect husband. That never takes us into that situation, but he could. Because we have his Torah on it. Remember, the Torah is just not written out of, it's not just like Moses went, I don't think right there. I don't like that third wife of mine, I don't write this down. It didn't work like that. Every word that he penned was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And everything that we see in the Torah. Is a type and shadow of what we're going to see later. And then there was another thing that Carol brought up too. Now, just work. And now again, again, now we can't we can't look at this from the perspective of now. But I'm going to lean on Toby's mom, Miss Carol, for a second. We can't remember a time when what I'm about to say would be the case. Okay. Let's take that dude for just a second. He gets jealous. He takes his wife into the priest. And she's not guilty. And so, of course, she goes through the whole thing. She gets embarrassed. She has to drink this the bitter water. But nothing happens. In other words, he has falsely accused her. Did you know that there's a Torah commandment against that? Yep. Yeah, there is. There is. It's called, you shall not bear false witness. Right. And yet he did. So now he's accused his wife wrongly. Now he's got to go out into the community and everybody's going to know. Now, for y'all, it might be new. For me and Carol, we can remember a time if a husband, especially in the South, if a husband accused his wife wrongly, dude, you didn't want to go back in the public because every other husband in the community would give you what for. They'd tell you exactly what they thought. And it wasn't much. So this guy's going to face community. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What? 
community backlash at least. But what I'm looking for is uh, shame. Shame. Yeah. Because you, you, you don't judge your accuser. Why could she do anything? Oh, huh? well, you just mad at her? So there's that that was going on. And the fact that he had got, he was guilty. He breached the Torah by committing a false witness against his wife. But not only a false witness, but was that three witnesses had to be, uh, was that well in no effect as well? Like three witnesses had to. Well, yeah, it was supposed to be what we read here when we read this, talked about where this happened or the husband suspected this happened and there were no witnesses. Nobody saw anything. He just got his honey on his shoulder and decided, well, oh, thank you. Oh, was, that, was that rule still in effect? Yeah, it was still in effect. Okay. Yes, it was. Like if you, if you accuse somebody of murder, there had to be two witnesses. Everything had to be established by two witnesses. And in this case, you could say if she drank the bitter waters and she got ill, then the second witness would have been gone itself. So that would have been your, your second witness. So this this whole the bitter waters thing is a picture of what we deal with today with our husband and us as the bride. He could, but he doesn't take us into the Holy of Holies and embarrass us. Instead, what does he do? He gives us a sign. He convicts us. And through the Holy Spirit, he basically has a discussion with us and says, look, you wronged me. And he gives us a chance to come back to him, to repent, to make things right. And in his mind, it's as if that thing didn't happen. So there was every opportunity for the husband to do this. Now, there's another thing, too, that we talk about. We have, there is no record. If we go back and look at the sages and all that sort of, there's no record of this ever taking place. Right. Just like the whole thing about the son, uh, if you have a blaspheming son, take this, check the child out and stone the child. There's no record of that ever happening. Once again, they're in a Torah community. There was a time, I'm going to fall back to my sister Carol again. There was a time in this country, I can remember it, when the murder rate was super low. Because the biblical death penalty was on the table all the time. And there was no, well, I just wasn't feeling good. No, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so... In the early 50s, the murder rates were low because the death tape, the death penalty was on the table. Yeah. And it was, it was, and it, a deterrent to that kind of crime. Yeah. So here you have this deterrent to an offense that's on the books. Now, if you were a lady back then, I wouldn't even want a chance having to face that. If you got taken into the into the holy place and you're innocent, then you have nothing to worry about. Because nothing's going to happen. You're just going to drink some water. But, but nothing's going to happen. However, you knew that if you were guilty and you drank that water, you knew basically it was a death sentence. Just like with that son who was unruly, children at that point knew that if they were blasphemers or if they were uh, disrespectful of their parents, they could face stunk. Um, I guarantee you that if that were true today, we'd have a whole lot less problems with the young generation. No, I'm not saying we need to stun our kids. I'm just saying that, that, that the Lord put these things into place. The whole idea of stunning someone who had done something wrong. I mean, he put those things into place as deterrents. The whole uh, issue of uh, today, and then I was racist, but not, so, so I've already told these long. And while it's in my possession, it breaks or I break. It doesn't matter. But while it's in my possession, it's no longer operable. My requirement is to make sure when it goes back to him, it's prepared, it's clean, and it's full of fuel when it goes back to him. Most of us were raised that way. You know, that's a Torah requirement. 
That's not something our dads thought of. That's something that dad thought of. Because they had the whole thing about if you if somebody if you were borrowing somebody's uh, somebody's ox and the ox got out or whatever it was the whole retribution thing. You had to pay that person back. And sometimes you had to pay them back sevenfold for whatever the issue was. Doesn't we don't read of that incident ever happening because again, it's a Torah community. The Torah is out there. And these people are living by it. So it's like, okay, if I need to borrow his, his donkey in this case, I need to make sure that I take care of that animal before I take it back. So these are, to me, these are things we, that we need to kind of put in place when we're, when we're mid-rashing and thinking about what we read in the Torah. It was a different, obviously, a different culture, a different atmosphere. They didn't live in a vacuum. It's like She's taught us before about when we when we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, we're the center, we're the eye of the storm. The storm rages around us, but where we are, there's supposed to be peace. The storm was raging around us today while we were trying to worship the Lord. Mm -hmm. And although it didn't seem like it, because Dan was running around with his hair on fire, <laughs> there was peace here because we were all determined we were going to worship the Lord. And that drives the enemy back crazy. Yeah. And I like that. <laughs> so Israel itself, even though they weren't living in a vacuum, all of those nations that they lived, that lived around them, they were all involved in the storm. The Israel, if you will, was the eye. There was peace in Israel. While they were walking in the covenant, but all around them, there was chaos and a lack of peace. Does that make any sense to anybody or was I just going to laugh about it? <laughs> anybody have anything else to add on that? Something that may be different or something? Hang the window back there. I can tell the big one. <laughs> that was a good opportunity to close up. They're thinking about stuff and they're not saying anything. Well, I want to move on to Acts. If nobody's got anything, let's go to Acts. There's your chance. Well, no, let's don't go to Acts. Let's go, let's stay in numbers. But let's go to the end of chapter six. Because we're told about the blessing that I will speak over us this afternoon. Gretchen, do you need the microphone? No, I'm just going to ask if someone to unlock the doors. Oh, we need someone to unlock the doors? Oh, it's on their summit. They're late. Well, it's like service is over now, so <laughs> service is over. <laughs> um, well, let them in. Do you, wanna, yes. do you want me to use my app? Okay. Yeah. I was we trying to get, app. we're trying to get the live streamers back on too because their devices are. Yeah, it, yeah. Something, there's a connection server somewhere yeah. along the line that it comes, keeps cutting in and out. So I just tell them to reconnect until. Okay. So, all right. So, so at the end of numbers, verses 20 through 27, we see, and Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, Speak to Aaron. Doors open, Gretchen. Thanks. And to his son and say, King James, on this wise, or this is how you will bless the children of Israel and you will say this to them. And of course, we have there the priestly blessing. Verse 27 is what we need to realize and understand anytime somebody speaks priestly blessing over us or you have it spoken to you, this is where we understand what is being said. God said, and they, they, those who pronounce the blessing, will put my name upon the children of Israel. So this is not just a blessing. This is whoever is speaking and is putting the name of Yahweh on the people. And we have God's promise right there. And I will bless them. It's almost like a commandment or statute. What? Because we're told this is how you do it. This is, you want to put my name on somebody, this is how you do it. And if you look into it, maybe one of, these, one of these weeks we'll do a study on this blessing. Once again, you look at this in the Hebrew, there we we don't get it. 
we just do not get it. And you frequently hear people say when they when they quote this in English, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord. The text doesn't say that, and we need to not say that because that's more of a request. <clears throat> God didn't put this in a form of a request. He said, this is how you are to bless the people of Israel. You are to say, Yahweh bless you, keep you. Yahweh make his face shine on you. Not may he, or may you not roll the dice, he might. And you can use the word may, the implication there is that, well, spin the wheel, we'll see. Maybe it'll work if it won't. Depends on you yeah, it depends on how good you are this week. No authority there. Because we know what last week was like, so. Yeah. Yeah. Right, there's no authority there at all. So why would we bother? Right. Again, once again, I just, I'm letting y'all in on uh, just some things that, that we talk about. We have, welcome y'all, we have talked about the idea of what we really long to do and I, I have my second witness is sitting right back there. The generally, we have had a disservice done to us because the Christian walk that we have been told about is weak. It's a failure. There's no power in it. Now, if you want proof, why is it that the young people of today, the I mean, which generation letter it is, but the, the actually the, like the, the 30 year olds and under, they're fleeing from the church. Why? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and the fact that it's powerless. What Carissa was going when we were talking about the, the blessing, she's going, eh, you know, right? Is if we if we're praying, and if my prayer for you is, Lord, if it's your will, please make my sister feel better. That's boring. And you know what else? It's not scriptural. And yet, because we didn't want to offend anybody or challenge anybody, we thought that was, that was the best way to pray. God never tells us to pray like that. So what Carol and I hope to be able to do as the years go on is readjust all of us so that we we learn. I just told a, another brother Thursday, Prayed over him and spent some time with him. It's been pronounced his freedom for him. And then, but then I told him, I said, you've got to walk this out. We have been promised the victory. We read that we are more than conquerors through Yeshua Messiah. Now, a conqueror is pretty good. Because that dude's bad only just on just to start, that dude's bad. But when you add more than that's a bad dude, y'all. And that's us. But we haven't been taught or encouraged to walk that out. And it's never going to be easy. But one of the things that Carol and I hope that we can do as we share with y'all through the years is to bring us back to that place where we're not afraid to walk it out. And we do so knowing full well, just like we read here on the priestly blessing, this is how you will put my name on the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Yes. Doesn't say, Gretchen, that we might. It doesn't say, Corinth, that we need to roll the wheel. It says he will bless you. And we need to learn to walk it. Doesn't mean that we won't face things because we will. Yeshua told us. In this life, you will have tribulation, you will have trial, you're going to have trouble, and it may be a flat tire. You're going to have issues, it's going to come up because we're, we're, this is life, we're just living this life. Y'all could have went home. You could have changed that tire and went home. 
won't let you hear. But you could have gone home. That's an example of pushing through. Y'all could have stayed home that day. And I'm here to tell you, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you had stayed home that day, you'd still be in that RV. Cool. Because you honored him. Absolutely. And he promised that he would bless us. He promised. I don't know what y'all are in for, but you're in for something because you changed the tire and you're like, no, we're going. And here you are. So do this. Be ready because it's on the way. <laughs> All right, we were going to act. I know that. I don't thought it was on the way. And why are we going to act? Because it says something about uh, the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul converted to Christianity, right? <laughs> That's Jordy. Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? Acts what, baby? It's right behind there. Yours. Acts 21. Hey, um, just to seal the deal on the um the whole um jealousy thing. Sure. The reason why that he has that jealousy ritual right in the middle of that, you know, we're talking about uh, he talks about um what the what the uh Levite families were supposed to bring mm -hmm. and what their duties were, and he talks about purity in the camp. After that, we talk about the Nazarite vow and we've got the Aaronic, Aaronic blessing mm -hmm. where God pronounces. It's, it's So why is that jealousy ritual right in the middle of that? You know, it, it really almost doesn't make sense, but I just want to um, seal the deal by, I just want to read what Teresa Gildenhouse wrote okay. in the chat because we missed it. And I don't think she's online anymore. I think a lot of people could not get back on. They could not reconnect. But however, we will have this as a video yeah. posted to YouTube as soon as Dan can get to I um, mean, you know, his edits, and as soon as we get it edited, to yeah, the free time. But anyhow, just to seal the deal, the reason why the man, the reason why the man is not held accountable is because the man in that in that account represents God. God is always faithful. Always, He never is unfaithful, and that's basically what Teresa says. She said, if you think about adultery in the Torah as a picture of a picture of, of Adonai, it brings more clarity to why the man was not mentioned. Adonai is always faithful. Yep. So the woman represents the bride of Messiah, the body of believers, both men and women, yep. even though that's a female there, you know, it's really the bride. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, and and said that, I wish she was still there so we could talk to her about that. But when you think about that too, once again, as has been pointed out numerous times, when we were dealing with that thing in numbers, we're dealing with the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel. We don't know what we teach according to Ephesians 2, because it's not some one off situation. According to Shorty, we are grafted into the nation of Israel. So those, those, instructions, those examples that we see from ancient Israel apply to us as Israel today. That's a great observation. So uh, Acts 21, in verse 17, and when they came to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And the day following that, Paul went in with us to James, James who? James Smith. <laughs> Who is this James? It's important to establish it. Yeshua's half brother. Known by the little history lesson, known by some as old camel. Man. Because James didn't believe in Messiah when he was coming up. He was raised with him. Same household. Didn't believe him to be the Messiah. So James. The other son of Miriam and Joseph believed in Messiah after his resurrection and ascension. And he was so sold out that he spent so much time on his knees before the risen Lord that his knees looked like the knees of a camel. That this is that James, who was at that time was the the, the head of the Jerusalem Kahal, the Jerusalem Assembly, the Ecclesia there in Jerusalem. And, and so by, by default, he was where everybody went to Jerusalem to see James. He was like 
to do. He was the one that was that had the conferences, that had the the council, and all those sort of things to decide. What do we do with all these goyim that are now coming in the faith? Well, how do we handle Gentiles in the house of a Jew, Jews in the house of a all, all those things that ministry people have to handle, James was in charge of it. So they went to James, and all the elders were present. We don't know who they were. We know they were there. And when he, Paul, had saluted them, he declared, particularly or in detail, the things that God had brought about among the Gentiles as a result of his ministry. And when they all heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who believe, and they are all zealous. Zealous for what? For what? But this is the New Testament. You need to say that for the live stream, I think, if they're on. If they're on. Yeah, this is the New Testament. No, what that person yeah, she said, zealous. They're all the, zealous. For zealous the for the Torah. Thank you. That's Why? Right. Because nobody said to stop. Nowhere in Scripture is it ever written that we were to stop keeping or stop observing the instructions of Adonai. It's not there. And Paul goes on. Now remember, this is post resurrection. Post ascension, this is quote the early church, if you will. Verse 20 again at the end, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they all are zealous for the Torah. And they are informed of you, talking about James, and why how you teach all the Jews that you're among the Gentiles to forsake, not sorry, this is James talking to, to Paul. They're informed that you, this is that false accusation, Robin. That you, you're teaching the Jews that are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children or walk back to the customs. And so what is it? The multitude needs to come together, for they will hear that you have come. In other words, Paul, word child on you, Bo. And the rumor is, is you're telling all these people they don't have to keep the Torah anymore. There's a lot of good, faithful, Fill in denomination of your choice out there who would say, Wasn't well, that he was teaching that? But if he was, then why does he need to make an explanation to them about what's going on? Because James just said, They're going to show up here, they're going to find out you're here, they're on the way, they're going to be knocking at the door, and they're going to want some kind of an explanation. He goes on, he says, Verse 23, so therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men. Which have a vow on them. We read about this. Which vow is this? The Nazarite vow. Now, the Nazarite vow is not really well covered in Scripture. What it boils down to is the person, and actually a woman or a man can take a Nazarite vow. Obviously, the ladies might have been worried about her beard and stuff, okay? But the deal with the Nazarite vow was that at that, at that point, you simply consecrated yourself to the Lord. Now, the vow could be for a day. It can be for a week. It could be a month. Some people took a vow for years. I know of a man currently who has another ministry out in Charlotte, North Carolina, who's been on the master right vow for a decade. And we moved to Jerusalem and moved back to Charlotte. And he still has himself on a master right vow. And that's what he's chosen to do. So the vow itself is the, 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 the length of the vow is determined by the person who took the vow. You with me? Okay, so when the vow is over, there's a certain set of requirements you have to do, we read about, in order to release yourself from the vow. We read the whole thing about shaving the hair, shaving the eyebrows, putting that on the fire, the whole, that whole thing. And so look what's going on here. So James is saying, we've got four men that have a vow on them. So you take them and purify them yourself with them. Wait a minute. Why would he then purify himself with them who are on a vow? But you think we can't right? He must have been on a vow himself. And he's he's ready now. There's some James is saying, oh look, look, take them with you, release yourself from the vow at the same time. Why? 
because this would be an example to all those who are saying you're not teaching the Torah anymore. He would only go and release himself from the vow if he were under a Torah instruction. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to release himself from the vow. So he says, go purify yourself and then be at the charges. This King James for do what you're supposed to do so that they may shake their heads and so that all may know that those things that were informed concerning you, in other words, all the tales that we hear, that they are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the Torah. So at this point, there it is in the text, this point, obviously Paul is still keeping the Torah. And it was a big deal for him to demonstrate that he kept the Torah. And so verse 45, of course, as touching the Gentiles which were believed, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing except only they keep themselves from things offered to idols, keep themselves from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. Now, once again, a bunch of folks think this is all that we as going have to do. Because they forgot to read that other verse where they first gave this instruction. Y'all remember what that verse said? Let's go there. That's in chapter 15, verse 20. It's the same thing. This is where they first came over. They sent the letter out. We have to keep reading. So verse 15, uh, chapter 15, let's start at verse 19. They're, you know, they're deciding what's going to go on this. So this is James speaking. James says, my sentence or my decision is this. That we don't trouble them that are from the Gentiles who have been turned to Adonai. Write to them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, abstain from fornication, abstain from things strangled, and abstain from blood. This is where we need to stop. Problem is, is that the next verse starts with the word for. Now, I don't know about you, Carol, but I don't usually start off a thought with for or because. That implies that this verse is tied to the previous verse. It's almost like a conjunction. It's not specifically a conjunction, but it's like acting in that in that category. You start off with a because, because there's something you just said that you want to explain. You start off with a for, for the same reason. He told them to do those things for or because Moses this the King James says of old time, your translation may say is currently or constantly or regularly read, something like that. What do you got, Gretchen? Uh, for Moses from ancient generations. Okay, so in ancient generations, in every city, they have those, him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So apparently, they gave these instructions to the Gentiles. So they can get into the synagogue. Why? To hear the Torah being read. Not so that they can evade the Torah, but so they can go and be taught the Torah. Even today, these four things that we see in verse in chapter 15 and in chapter 21 are known as the four pillars of Torah. Somebody who is a convert to Judaism, not to, not to follow a Messiah, but to Judaism. These are the four things that are required in order to be able to get into the synagogue as a full-fledged student, if you will. You have to make sure that you are doing these things. They said the same thing then. I can do these four things so they can get in there so they can read the Torah. So we verse back in chapter 21. We're told that they need to do those things. That we're, we're reminded they've already given that instruction and then verse 26 and so paul took them in and the next day purified himself with them and entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until an offering could be offered for every one of them of course when the seven days were over then we get when paul show, saw in the temple and they saw him they were all stirred up and they cried out Men of Israel, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and against the law and against this place. And further, he has brought Greeks also into the temple and has polluted this holy place. 
I just want to stop there for just a second. This goes on today in the church when we don't conduct ourselves the way that other people think we should, or you know, those wacky folks like Ivan, Nicola, Gretchen, he's just forsaken Jesus. He doesn't even keep Christmas and Easter anymore. What are we going to do with him? I'm concerned for his salvation. That's because people don't understand what we're doing. And it's necessary for us to be able to explain what we're doing. Not, not from, I'm doing better than you're doing, or I'm closer to the Lord because we're not. It's not about that. It's about moving back into that shelter of blessing and protection that God has promised us. We just read it over in Leviticus with regard to the, the blessing. So that why? Because God says, then I will bless them. Deuteronomy 28, we're not there yet. Of course, it's the blessings and the curses. And the first thing, the first 14 verses talk about in order to experience the blessing, you have to do something. You have to read and keep the commandments, which later on in Deuteronomy we're told these are not too hard for you. They're not too hard. Otherwise, again, we we've been taught, I taught it, maybe may have taught it, that the Taurus is too hard to keep. No, it isn't. But if it is, God's a liar. Now, Orthodox Judaism is difficult to keep because in some, in the more orthodox Judaisms, there are like 200 things you have to do in order to properly keep Shabbat. When in fact, when we read the Torah, all it says is, keep it holy, don't work. That's all it says. Well, it's supposed to be a holy complication. Here we see. So Paul is that second witness to the Nazarite's battle. Somebody talks to you again and, and, and brings up Paul as uh, this conversion to Christianity, or where even Paul realized that he didn't have to keep the law and we'll take him here. We'll just take him here. Let the word of God speak for itself. Uh, St. Augustine is said to have made the quote that truth, when talking about the word of God, is like a lion. doesn't need you to defend it. All you need to do is turn it loose. And it will defend itself. So take them here. Because here, this, this counteracts that whole thing. And there was one other thing that I heard today, too. And then we're going to let everybody go. I got to get where I'm going. Yeah, it's almost five. Do you know why Paul, and not Peter, was assigned the job as the apostle to the Gentiles? Now think it through. Who was the first one of the disciples to preach to the Jew? I'm sorry, to preach to the Gentile. Equal at the house of Cornelius. Because he had that whole deal about I'm not supposed to go in. God said, You better get. So Paul's the first one, I mean, Peter's the first one to teach Yeshua to the Gentile. So why didn't the Lord just let him keep mentioning teaching the Gentiles? Why didn't the Lord assign Paul or Peter now to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles? You ever think about that? You ever wonder about that? Because within Judaism, Peter was a nobody. He was a fisher. Oh, yeah. He was a low life. Fisher. What a terrible thing to have to do. Be a fisher. Smell of white fish all the time. So the Lord chose him. Remember, we read in 1 Corinthians that he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Here you've got Peter, a fisherman who probably just barely knew most of the Torah. Now he's teaching the Jews about the risen Messiah because it's firsthand experience 
with firsthand evidence. Who better to teach? Now you have Paul being assigned to the Gentile, who was Paul. He was accused of murder. He was accused of murder. Well, aside from being a murderer. He was the son of a Pharisee. He was a rabbi. Yes. He learned under Gamaliel. He was a rabbi of a, a Benjamite of Benjamites. Mm -hmm. He was a rabbi, a Pharisee of Pharisees by his own accounting. He was a brilliant Torah scholar. Mm -hmm. Who better to teach a bunch of goyim that are still eating shellfish <laughs> about the Torah? Mm -hmm. A man who was raised in the Torah. Which would be, to me, would explain why when he went to places like Colossia, Corinth, all of those places. Remember, we can we can read about it, read about it in the Book of Acts more than you can read about it in his epistles. We read where he went into these places, and then people wouldn't let him leave. They were like, "No, no, no, no! Heck, stick around. We need to know some more of this." So Sabbath after Sabbath, he was still teaching in these places. Why? Obviously, he was teaching in the synagogue. But he's also teaching these God-fearing Gentiles how to walk in the Torah because they had known nothing, which is why the, the apostles gave those the four pillars of Torah. I just that I got that this morning. I just thought, well, that's pretty cool. That is, yeah. The way that the Lord arranged it. So he was he was taking care of us even back then, and the guy that he assigned to take care of us was going to be teaching us. Torah, not teaching us not to walk in Torah. So that's all I got. That's all we got. Been a good interaction. Yes. I like that part about it. that question you brought up about the man and the whole that. I mean, that we, those are questions we need to ask. And that's the kind of thing that makes us think and dig. And we need to. That's how we get sharp. Father, we just want to thank you. It's been a we don't want, Lord, in spite of all of the trouble and the testing, it's been a good convocation. It's been a good Shabbat. It's been a good time of fellowship. It's been a good time of spending time in your presence. Let's magnify. We thank you for your presence among us. Thank you for getting the Burgess family here safe. Thank you for all those who were able to be with us as long as they were on the last plane. We thank you for the technology. Even though it can be frustrating, we thank you that because of the technology, we can still get the word out, make it available to those who missed it. We bless you. We magnify you. We ask you to cover each home represented here. May all of us leave this space, as my brother Fabian said, different than we were when we got here, yes. taking with us some nuggets, something, some clarifying understanding of your Torah, of your examples that we didn't have before. We bless you and magnify you and thank you that you are our King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that you are alive and you are on the throne, and that you make us more than confident. We thank you that we can do everything through you because you dwell in us, Messiah, and we thank you that the greater one lives in us, and that there is nothing that we need to fear, because if you are for us, who can be in this place? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Yeshua, thank you for your sacrifice, for seeing in us people that were worthy of your sacrifice. Doesn't matter how we think of ourselves, what matters is the way you think of us. Help us to remember that you see us as the apple of your mind. We thank you for these things. We speak blessings over this community. And we cancel the assignments of the adversary against them. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Everyone said it. Right up here. We will be obedient to what the Lord told Moses to tell Pharaoh. 
Now, here's another one, too. Why did Carol? Why did Carol? Why didn't the Lord just tell Aaron that himself? Why did he go, James? I want you to go tell Fabian to do so and so. I mean, why not just go Fabian? Go do so and so. Why did he tell Moses to tell Aaron? So they what? No, I was just making the no. Yes, you want one Moses was the leader. I would say, I would say, because Aaron was the first one. Well, Aaron was the first. He was the first one, so it would have been his. And as the first one, he would think that God would just told him. But Moses was like they was pointing. Moses was the one who was put in the lead position, even though Aaron was the high priest, and he was the only interesting. He was the high priest. He was the one that could go into the holy of holies once a year. Moses couldn't go there, but Aaron could. And yet God told Moses, I want you to go tell my high priest to do this. Receive the blessing of Adonai, wow. as Aaron was told to do. The Rock and Yahweh, the Yishma Rekha, the air, Yahweh, the Kabaleka, the Kabaleka, with the Sad of I, the Kabaleka, the Assembly, Shalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you his Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing out of place. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, amen. Shabbat shalom, everyone. All right, shalom. Shalom.